So the big question is this, how do value-obsessed leaders ascend their business and life to world-class levels of effectiveness, even if they're inside a bureaucracy or starting from scratch with absolutely no capital? That is the question, and this podcast is going to bring you the answer. My name is Doug Utberg, and this is the Terminal Value Podcast. Welcome to the Terminal Value Podcast. We have Matthew Ayak on with us today. And what we're going to be talking about is actually transitioning a business from first generation ownership to second generation ownership. And then we'll actually be moving on to figuring out how do you make sure that that passion stays with it in the third generation. But we'll get to that that in the conversation. Uh, Matt, welcome to the show and uh, please introduce yourself. Uh, Again, thank you so much for for having me. Uh, Name is Matthew Ayak. I'm one of the two partners of a multi-generational family company called U.S. Energy Development Corporation. Uh, operate a day job as really a financier and, and capital structure and underwriter of what we do in the investment side. But we're a traditional upstream E&P company that has been building for the next 40 years in all types of energy. So uh-huh. pretty vast business, uh, a lot of fun. And we, uh, on this topic, had the unique opportunity to go from a G1, Generation 1 company, to a generation two. And so we're planning on that long-term of succession plan of how do you do that even one more time? So yeah. this topic is pretty relevant for our history. Yeah. Well, and one of the things we were talking about in the pre-show is there's an old statement in the financial planning profession, which was shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. And what that, you know, you know, more colloquially, the way that they say that is the first generation builds the wealth, the second generation preserves it, and the third generation wastes it. And the numbers are actually disturbing as far as how many kind of generational wealth bases are pretty much dissipated by three generations. I mean, and so I think you're right now you're going through that first to second generation transition, but I think it's really thinking through how do you effectively execute that second to third generation transition where you don't end up creating an enormous problem for the fourth generation. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So uh, there's so much to unpack in that statement, right? So what's, what's really interesting is the statistics, not just in the U S but globally, yeah. on multi-generational businesses is really abysmal. It's actually yeah. almost a shame, right? Because you have these business entrepreneurs who create something amazing from nothing. Yeah. Like they should sleep yes. to turning around, you know, 30, 40, 50 years later and it's gone. And, you know, naturally I think companies are not that much different from people in that we age and yeah. if we don't progress, we die. So there, there is a natural part of this, right? But there's the unnatural part of, making this transition that's really, really just difficult each time it happens. Uh I'm not sure that the second generation plans any better than the first to to make that successful. So if if I kind of walk back and walk through what happens, I I think there's a bunch of issues in terms of, you know, entrepreneurs in general, not really always being the best business owners in terms Uh of operating their business, right? So they're, they're ingenious. They come up with these ideas, they build their companies, almost in spite of their management capabilities because they're just so gifted at what they do yeah. and bigger than life characters. And then that second generation, exactly as you described it, holds on to that wealth, right? They yeah. try everything they do not to lose the wealth, but then you've kind of flatlined your company. You've gone from growth into, and what you've changed is more of a lifestyle company mm-hmm. where it pays the bills, right? It generates income. It's almost like a portfolio. Yeah. Right? Ideally, it would be a very good lifestyle, but yeah, a great lifestyle, right? But the problem is with lifestyle portfolios or companies is if you're living off of them, yeah. the value starts to erode, right? Just yes. naturally. And then the third generation gets even more excited about that lifestyle, just takes a little bit more. It's almost like increasing your portfolio from yes. 4% dividends to six. And the statistics, you will run out of money in your lifetime at the difference between four and six. It's yeah. really that simple. And then add on to it all the complexities of business management and then estate taxes multiple times. And all of a sudden you've run out of wealth so quickly because yeah. you no longer are entrepreneurial. You're no longer growing, you're maintaining. And it's just this natural, horrific process that all the, these great companies tend to fade out over time if you don't really wipe the slate clean and continue to do what the first generation did, which is really you have to take calculated risks. You have to grow yeah. companies. You can't just maintain an idea because 
as we know, the world moves so fast, right? Whatever is relevant yeah. today, if you're not focusing on what's relevant 10 years from now, and trust me, in the energy space, I can say this with all certainty, right? Yeah. Things move really fast. And if you're so stuck in the mud and worrying about what made money and only repeating that, you're destined to fail. Yeah. Well, you know much more about energy than I do, but like the way that I would think is right. You know, if you had an old school mentality, you'd be saying, okay, you know what? Historically, energy business has been about hydrocarbons and it's about hydrocarbon exploration and refining. And so, you know, you could very easily say, forget about all this other stuff. You know, we're just going to focus on more exploration and refining. Problem is the sector is moving away from that, despite whether you're talking about tax or environment, you know, environmental taxes or penalties or whatever, about the just explosive growth in, like, say, for example, electric vehicles, which the thing is, people talk about electric vehicles. The electric vehicles aren't really about the vehicle. What they're about is the battery. The battery is what makes electric vehicles and electric everything for that matter really feasible. And so, you know, as the battery technology advances and you start being able to store energy, that actually changes the game because now things like wind and solar become more viable because the old reason why wind and solar work considered a science experiment is because you couldn't store the energy anywhere. So the sun shines, you produce energy, great. It goes into the grid, but you needed to have slack capacity in the grid anyway in order to meet your peak. But once you get to where you can store it in a battery, now release it when you need it, that changes the game. And so if you're stuck in that old way of doing things, you can have a whole bunch of capital tied up into something that, okay, yeah, maybe it's doing great now, but at some point could become obsoleted. Yeah, and it will. I mean, we can argue whether or not oil and gas will be used for the indefinite future, and it will, but it'll be used differently, right? Yeah. The most effective way of using oil is really not just as a fuel, it's really as petrochemicals. Uh-huh. Actually, yeah. probably the most recyclable of all assets, right? So using it as more of the plastics that make the casing for yeah. the battery that you're talking about, yeah. right? more so than the, the fuel to make it. It's a, it's a really interesting dynamic. You're not building your company towards that indefinite future, you're, you're building it towards its, its demise. Yeah. Right. So, and you know, get, I, I could get into a four hour dissertation with you about what will happen with hydrocarbons in that process, yeah. but it's irrelevant when we're talking about this topic, because really at the end of the day, there's always that saying of, if it isn't broken, don't fix it. And the reality is that's the worst concept, right? If it's not broken, yes. smash it into a thousand pieces and reassemble yeah. it and figure out how to build a better mousetrap. And if you're yeah. not, then you're going to be either not dead in G1, not G2, you might be dead in generation yeah. one, right? So yeah. uh, I think it's really important to keep that entrepreneurial spirit alive and that R&D budget alive in your mind, of figuring out how you're going to build the next mousetrap and not just operate efficiently within the current one. Yeah, well, and because one of the mental constructs that I try to, that I think about this way is that, you know, fundamentally, the way that all people make any decision, you know, pretty much for the history of history, is that they're either moving toward opportunity or, or toward perceived opportunity or away from perceived risk. You know, any decision is made for one of those two things. And I think what happens is that when you get to where you have either an a-, a certain amount of assets or a certain amount of success or whatever, it's easy to become risk averse you know, to where you start worrying about trying to minimize risk instead of maximizing opportunity. Now, of course, you know, now the truth of the matter is you have to do both, right? You, you need to always be thinking of how you can do appropriate risk mitigation, but if all you focus on is risk, then eventually you'll flatline and go into decline. And yeah. so I think what it's really about is still systemically making sure that you have that opportunity focus. It's funny that you say that because what you just said is the normal ending point of generation one. What yeah. most business owners have done at the end of generation one is they've actually set the next generation up for failure because they did exactly what you did. It, just like as we age, we become yeah. more risk adverse. So they've set their companies up not to fail, which ironically yeah. will set them up to fail. So, yes. and, and if the next generation leaves it there, right? And, and yeah. we define it as this internally as a company, and I'm sure a lot of people have gone through similar situations. The ability to change a culture is very, very hard. Yeah. It's almost impossible. But to build one is pretty easy, right? And so sometimes you got to break it down and you got to start rebuilding it versus just trying to make adaptations of people who've had yeah. ideas and concepts for 30 years. And they really do become that conservative protect yourself yeah. uh, attitude. And so that's, I think a lot of people don't realize that the G3 generation three switch is almost doomed at the end of G1 
because of the way that the business has been set up. And if you don't break that mold and stop, and, and I think a part of it is nostalgia, right? We're all so uh, proud of what that last generation built. We're yeah. also, we don't want to lose all that great history, right? And so it becomes this weight around people's necks to do it like their in-laws did, their parents uh-huh. did, their last generation did. And I think they have to not, they have to take all those great lessons and yeah. then do it their way, right? And I think that's really critical and it takes life. life. You can't teach someone it, it has to happen yeah. to them, right? But right. internally, there's also one step and I don't know if I'm jumping too far in this. There's more of the personal step that caused a lot of failure. And what I mean by that is- uh-huh. 80% of the time, there's not an alignment of interest in the beneficiaries of the company and the operators of the company. And generation one also often fails to help plan for the emotional part of the transition. So unpack that a little bit. I want to learn a little more about that. So again, this is kind of a sweeping generalization, yeah. but especially in the last generation of business owners in America, I'll keep it to America. They tend to be mavericks. They do things themselves. They, yeah. they build it up, Right. And ultimately, they haven't sat down and thought about their mortality. They haven't thought about the emotional part of what it's going to become for the next generation to be a beneficiary. And uh-huh. their interests are not aligned. Their identities are stripped from them. Yeah. You take them, you know, what they thought was a family company is now an estate, right? Yeah. That's impersonal, right? The, the company's running and a CEO is now running it off the betterment of the company, not the owner. Right. And it just becomes this unique concept yeah. where, you know, no one was prepared for this. No one was prepared to pay estate taxes. No one was prepared that, you know, this was now they weren't in control of what they thought was their family's identity. The yeah. identity is almost more important than the money. Right. <clears throat> yeah. You know, this was my family company. And what do you mean? It's a state asset that pays dividends. That's so weird to us. Right. And there's a lot of planning that people can do, like setting up philanthropic activities uh-huh. that involve the next generations. Yeah. The really great family offices and family companies have a really important philanthropic part of what they do. And it's not because everyone's a good person. It's often because they know that's what ties family together and keep them involved, right? And if the business can, outside of the C-suite, if the business can do good for the community, right? And the heirs have a say in that, it ties it back to feeling like it's their family, right? That it's their family doing good for something. And it keeps that identity. So even if they're not in the business, even if they don't work there, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's just a natural thing that never comes up in that entrepreneur's mind about what it takes to teach the next generation how to be good beneficiaries. They just don't have any idea. So you're setting up to fail on an emotional level. That's interesting. Well, it's, and because it actually kind of feels like what you're saying, which I agree with incidentally, is that, you know, in order to really be that effective second generation business leader, what you really have to do is basically to kind of take yourself back to that broke mindset where you're saying, okay, essentially we're saying, all right, we have a going concern, but you almost have to behave as though you're making something again from scratch and yeah. you're essentially needing to rebuild it. Because I think, like you said, it's like, you know, creating a culture is very easy. Changing a culture is extremely hard. Yeah. So no, I, I, you just put it perfectly, right? If you're not yeah. focused on that and you're just focused on repeating what was, then G3 is not going to make it. It's not going to get yeah. there. You set them up worse than you were set up in generation two. Yeah. Right. So yeah, it, it's really imperative that generation one focuses on interest alignment Generation two focuses on rebuilding the next great idea mm-hmm. and incubating those is really, really important, which means sometimes you meet, need younger staff, people no. you don't necessarily agree with. And you say, oh, those, those young people do it differently than us. Well, yes, that's, yeah. if they do it the same as you, someone's obsolete, right? You want people who do it differently and think differently to bring that in, to set up for future success, not just focus on margins and numbers, Right. And I think that's just where the, the biggest issue is. Yes, all the bases have to be covered. They do. But that's not the real reason you will succeed for yeah. multiple generations. Gotcha. Well, that was actually just thinking about a, a classic Dan Kennedy line where, you know, he'd, he'd say, if the two of us agree on everything, then one of us is unnecessary. <laughs> that's true. Uh, you know, and that sounds pithy, but, you know, I think, you know, but essentially what you're saying is, right, you know, if you bring in people who think too much like you on everything, then what you're doing is you're, you're literally creating just decision clones, which, you know, will necessarily result in kind of the status quo being perpetuated, which I think is what ultimately leads in, into that decline cycle. Which is ironically, I think from a societal standpoint, uh-huh. been the number one issue, I, I don't think we had the 
conversation. Yes. Right. We've, ne- we've never had this conversation about awareness, about inherent bias. Yeah. That we just, by the way, you know why I hire people like me? Because all of us have a little bit of narcissism in them, right? Like, yeah. I like me. I'm going to hire yeah. more of me. I was going to say. Intentional. Yeah. Yes, or, you know, d- depending on who we're talking to or a lot. But yes, all of us yes. have, have some. We, we, don't, we don't even mean to do it. You just, yeah. if two people are in the room and one is more likely like you, it just feels more comfortable, right? Yes. Well, the reality is until you have the awareness of that, you're not going to be able to change it because that's just human nature, right? That's the reason yeah. we stayed alive for thousands of years. Sure. We avoided danger. Things that are different. Let's avoid that, right? Let's go towards things that are similar so I don't get hurt. Well, cool, but that's what I think so many businesses have failed because they refuse to bring in the danger, yeah. which actually brings in that next great idea, which makes things more successful. So yeah, it's an issue. We focus so much on efficiency and we've lost kind of that creativity and ingenuity that we need to be great. Uh, that is excellent. I mean, and I think it's really prescient and meaningful because there's a lot of focus, I think, on you know kind of building your business up, but if you want it to sustain across multiple generations, then these are things that you have to be really delivered about. You do. And if it's not within the family, don't force yeah. it. Right? If there's no one there who wants the mantle of that visionary, find it on the outside. Don't be afraid mm-hmm. to bring it in. And a lot of people feel like, especially that generation one, they feel like it has to be someone because they built it. They want the pride of the name. Well, the pride of your enterprise and name can go on with other leaders at the helm. It doesn't yeah. have to be a direct descendant to be great, right? And, and I do think that's a inherent thing. I, maybe it's a sexist thing. Men, I think, especially feel that way, mm-hmm. we, right? Yeah. We've always felt that we, we've given our, our kingdom to the firstborn, right? Like, it's crazy how it's done from history. And, and I think a lot of that, you're not putting the best person in the role because you're yeah. putting the, the one person who makes you feel the most comfortable. It goes back to the same problem that we have in so many other ways, right, across the board. Outstanding. Lots of nuggets of wisdom there. Well, Matt, can you give us one or two last insights and then uh, tell everybody where they can find a little more? I would just say my biggest insight personally would be, and it sounds so cliche, find a phenomenal mentor every age. I finally started to do something which is really interesting. I don't, I can't say it's scientific yet because it's brand new, but I've started some reverse mentoring where I'm listening to people very different than me, much younger than me. Yeah. Because most of my mentors are older, more successful people. Yeah. It's just naturally what you go for, right? You go for someone yes. who's older, sure. more successful. It just makes sense, right? So recently, I guess I'm that old, successful guy now. It's weird, right? And a lot of my mentors are now 70 plus. And I've really started to think about this. So my one thing would be, I've tried it for last year. I've talked about my favorite people in the world. I've talked about it with going backwards and actually hiring, yeah. going to mentors who are much younger than me. Yeah. Who are very different than me, women, people of color, you name it, and asking them in our business and outside what's going on, right? And just getting a perspective that I can't teach myself. I can yeah. I can read about it, but I can't teach it. So it's been an interesting concept. I wish someone was really good at doing reverse mentoring so I could learn more, but yeah. I'm, I'm trying it. I'm trying to figure out if reverse mentoring is going to lead to that next path. Well, and the thing that I love about that is that you're trying something out without necessarily knowing whether it's going to be valuable or not, but you won't know that it's valuable unless you go through the effort to try it. Yeah, it's true. And a lot of us don't have a lot of time. So you, you, know, you try to focus on the most efficient things. Yeah. You don't do those really important things. I, I think it's going to work out phenomenally well, yeah. but that's my one nugget of let's hope that it brings as much value as the mentors I've had who did change everything for me, listening to people who know a lot more than me. Uh, and my last piece is this, and it's only because I'm really worst at this. My wife will tell you this. All my employees will tell you this. My mother-in-law said to me one time, God gave you two ears and one mouth. Use them in proportion. I don't, but I try to adhere to it and listen to more people. Outstanding. Well, let us know, uh, where can people connect to you, either on social or your website? US Energy, usedc.com is our, our website. Yep. I mean, on LinkedIn. I don't do a ton of social media outside of LinkedIn. Most of it's, it's kind of business-related. But that, those would be the two places I'd say to, to reach out or, you know, in any way you can find me. All right. Hey, Matt, I really appreciate your time today. Thanks, Doug. All right. Thank you for listening to the Terminal Value Podcast. Please feel free to visit me online at www.terminalvalue.biz where you can subscribe, find me on social, and then we can connect and just keep the conversation going. I'm really looking forward to hearing from you and I hope you have a wonderful day.
All rights reserved. No part of this broadcast may be produced in any form by any means without written permission from Business of Life, LLC. All trademarks and brands referred to herein are the property of their respective owners.